So competition helps even when it doesn't change who wins because it changes what winners do. Yeah. And again, that's what we're about is what winners are going to do. We need the competition not to change necessarily who wins, as I say, but to change what the winners are going to do and what they're going to care about and to bring forth new issues and innovative ideas into the system. That's what competition is going to give us. Prominent CEOs, leading economists, iconic investors, insights from the experts. The Walker Webcast with Willie Walker. See who's next. And uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I am in uh, snowy Colorado today and uh, very, very excited for this discussion uh, with Catherine today. Let me do a brief introduction of Catherine and then we will dive into our discussion. Um, Catherine Gale is the founder of the Institute for Political Innovation, a nonpartisan nonprofit founded in 2020 to catalyze modern political change in America. Catherine is the originator of politics industry theory and author of the, pol the pol politics industry, how political innovation can break partisan gridlock and save our democracy, which he co-authored with Harvard Business School professor, Michael Porter. A veteran of public and private sectors, Catherine is the former president and CEO of Gale Foods, a $250 million high-tech food manufacturing company based in Wisconsin that she sold in 2015. In the public sector, Catherine served on the board of, over of the Overseas Private Investment Corporation, OPIC, the US government's development finance institution. She is on several nonprofit boards, including Unite America, New America, and Business for America, and is an active philanthropist. She is also the honorary co chair of the National Association of Nonpartisan Reformers and the co founder of Democracy Found. So, Catherine, let's start here. Um, I, I know the book was your idea. Um, and you, if you will, recruited our mutual friend, Mike Porter, to come and write it with you. And you self-describe yourself as an orphan Democrat centrist independent, which makes two of us. Um, but tell me a little bit about going from the, pub, from the private sector and having run a very successful business and what really pulled you towards this mission and then how you and Mike came to writing this great book. Yeah, uh, thank you, Willie. I'm so happy to be here. Uh, so, yes, I had my career in my food manufacturing uh, company that I loved so much. And yet now, as you heard, I seem to be a one trick pony on things to do with democracy in America, right? That's the core of what I do. So in 2015, I sold my business so I could do this work full time. And where that came from is really what I describe in my book is the five stages of political grief. And I'll just run through them really quickly, which is as a citizen and as a business leader and as a parent, I cared right deeply about our, the, our democracy. And so at first I thought, oh, I'll get involved in candidates and, you know, I won't just vote. I'll actually support good candidates. And so I did that. And I was at that time uh, supporting Barack Obama for president. He's someone I had known for many years. And he went to the White House and I was super disappointed with how things unfolded after that when I looked at Congress, you know, and I thought, wow, here we are massively polarized. It's not about just the presidency. Congress has a huge problem. So I said, oh, I won't do um, candidates anymore. I'll do culture you know, like people should work together. So I got involved with this organization called No Labels, where everybody says they want to, you know, be past partisanship. But then I was like, oh, well, they say that, but then they all vote the same way and do the same things. Hmm. Second stage, it's not culture. I know I'll do policy. So I got involved. Uh, the debt and deficit are huge issues for me. I got involved in the CEO Fiscal Leadership Council for Fix the Debt. And then after a while, I said, oh, Everybody knows the broad outlines of the policies that we need, but nobody will vote for it. Okay, it's not policy. So I know I'll do candidates again, but this time I'll do candidates that are independent and they're not beholden to the Republicans or the Democrats. And then I said, oh, they can't get elected. So finally, it became clear to me, thanks to a, a former congressman named Mickey Edwards, that it's the system stupid is how I would put it. Remember, Bill Clinton's it's the economy stupid. So it's a systems stupid. I'd always been a systems thinker in business. You're probably a systems thinker yourself. 
as are many of the watchers. And I can't believe it took me that long to see it for politics, which is to say the rules of the game create the incentives that drive the behavior that deliver us what we're getting and that the problem is in the system, not where we think it is with the people or the policies or the culture. And so given that framework, if you will, how did you come to talk to Mike Porter about this and take the his five forces analysis and apply it to the industry of politics? So I was still at my company and I ran a classic business strategy project in 2013. And I had Michael Porter as our consultant. So while we were doing this strategy project and revisiting all of the five forces that I also learned in business school, of course, with Michael Porter right in front of me, I was super interested in how to, you know, how my business succeed and sell more cheese sauce, essentially. But I was running a parallel analysis in my head, like this half of my head was looking suddenly at the politics industry. So when you look at the five forces, you're talking about who the rivals are. And I'm like, oh, there's only two. There's Democrats and Republicans. It's a duopoly. And then you're looking at who can enter the market to compete against you. And I thought, oh, my gosh, in politics, nobody can get into the market. There's super high barriers to entry for any new competitors. And I started thinking about things like, huh, in any other industry, like in my industry, if I had only one competitor and we were making our customers so unhappy the way Democrats and Republicans basically have massive um, unhappiness, if you think of Congress's you know, 90% disapproval rating, if it were my industry or probably yours, new competitors would come in to give the customers what they want. But that never happens in politics, which eventually led me to realize that these two uh, two rivals in the duopoly work really well together in one very particular uh, particular way behind the scenes, and that is to rig the rules of the game to protect themselves jointly from new competition. And when there's never any new competition, there's no incentive to do what most of the customers want you to do. And so what we have is a situation where our, our, two, um, our two rivals in politics are doing what it takes to succeed in the current rules of the game. But if we change those rules of the game, we can change how those businesses need to work so that in order to be successful, they actually have to please the majority of November voters, shall we say. So the book, there's so much in the book that I want to cover here, and there's so much neat sort of, I, I, it's not behind the scenes, it's just more of a historic perspective of kind of how we've gotten to where we are that I want to dive into a little bit, because there's all sorts of neat things that you talk about, the House Ways and Means Committee and the Rules Committee, and how things have changed to make it so that it's a, it's a very sort of party dominated, speaker dominated House of Representatives today. But let's back up, because you and Mike focus on um, the Gilded Age and the, nine, the 1860s to the 1900 timeframe and basically say, we've gone through this cycle before. And you, you lay out very clearly, Catherine, how at that time there was immigration that was threatening people's jobs. So there was, for the first time ever, legislation passed to stop Chinese immigration into the United States. Um, and you talked about um, all sorts of actions, if you will, of consolidation of power, money and politics, um, single party control, the, the robber barons at that time who really were able to control the political system, all these types of things that we are seeing today, and also kind of a trend towards authoritarianism during that period of time. Talk for a moment about the parallels there. And then what I really want to get to is how we got out of that, because you explain that. But I think as I sit here in today's world, I say, okay, I get it that we've been through this before. But what was it that got us out of it? Yeah. And uh, that is the reason we put it in the book was much less about the parallels for today and more about the how we got out of it. But indeed, it is shocking that uh, that there was this time period about 100 years ago when when the country was confronted with much of the similar forces at work that we regularly decry 
or blame today. And I, the, the important thing to know about that, I think is less the specific details, although please do get the book and, and read it. Um, and more the fact that our country has been less, our trajectory and our, um, our suspected future, let's say, has been less clear at multiple times in our history. It hasn't been this, oh, we found it, you know, we we won the war and then got our amazing constitution. It's kind of all been up from there. We've really had to figure out how to govern underneath what the constitution gives us at multiple times. That the constitution itself is only is super short, right? I mean, you can have a I think I have my pocket constitution over here somewhere. Yeah. So, you know, it fits in the cons in a pocket. That's the whole point of it, of the pocket constitution. And so it's the rules underneath that that we make up and that we had made up 100 years ago in the Gilded Age that can distort the day to day business of actually managing a country within these these freedoms and values given by our constitution. And uh, that's been in trouble and the people had to take it in hand that it was their democracy and insist that changes be made that really delivered power back to a majority of people instead of dividing up what I call the spoils of power among those in power. So one of the key things that is you talked about the um, everything from the what was it um, when they did the canon, the canon reform of 1910, I guess it was. But prior to the canon reform of 1910, you talk about the the you talk about journalism and about the newspapers and the and, and the change of the newspapers from being controlled essentially by the rubber barons to being muckrakers and finding out all the corruption that existed in the system. And I think one of the things that you and Mike underscore so well in the book is that cable television right now has really added as this massive catalyst to the polarization of America. And so if I go back to your explanation of how things turned, one of the key catalysts was the media, if you will, or newspapers. Do you think we can get either out of cable news or get some type of media that's gonna turn us out of this hyper-polarized world that we live in today? Super great question because there are so many causes that reinforce each other in delivering our dysfunctional politics and therefore our dysfunctional and disgruntled and dissatisfied body politic. And they create what a, a great political scientist named Lee Drutman calls the doom loop of you know, our current politics. So, the, so back then, if you think there was a doom loop then as well, you're correct, the media started to change. And whenever you disrupt something in any kind of a system where this begats that, begats that, you know, then you change the dysfunction of that, right? You sort of divert the train to another track. And media started that. I don't predict that media is going to start that now. I, I believe that anywhere in the doom loop, if you could change something, it could be the disruptor. But one of the things that I focus on is always being completely rational and realistic about what things we can change. I actually don't think we have a lever to pull to change the media and have it start from there. I believe that when you change some other things in the system that over which we do have power, that then the media will adapt to uh, to a business model that can support the kind of healthy political environment that I would envision, but we're gonna to have to interrupt it in a different place. Talk for a moment, I think one of the things that I, as I was reading your book, I found fascinating was, it wasn't until 1913 that the US public actually elected senators to go to Washington to represent their states. That the 17th amendment actually gave citizens the ability and took it away from the state legislatures as it relates to um, sending senators to, to, to DC. And then um, you also point out of just another kind of interesting stat, and I'd love to hear any of the other ones that you found as you were researching the book, 
But the other one was that, you know, we talk about gerrymandering today and how we cut up these various districts so that they stay either deeply blue or deeply red. And um, I had not known that back in the day, Dakota was split between North Dakota and South Dakota so that the Republicans could have two more Senate seats um, uh, kind of guaranteed by splitting the state in half. I, I, I didn't know that's how we got a South Dakota and a North Dakota. Yeah, look, uh, some of the interesting things are to know is that there's always been and there always will be an effort by any players in any industry to affect the rules of how things work in that industry to benefit them. And instead of pretending it shouldn't be that way, we need to understand that's a human motivation and has a good side to it, which is it's competition to get better, et cetera, as long as competition also holds holds companies and actors in check, shall we say, which is what we don't have now in politics. But so gerrymandering, um, not only have the players in politics always been thinking about how the creation of new states would affect the balance of power, and then there are deals made about that, but they also gerrymandering itself, the drawing of districts dates back to the beginning of our Republic. It actually is named the, the word gerrymandering, which is where I think most of your listeners know uh, voters, uh, sorry, politicians sort of pick their voters by drawing their districts rather than voters picking their politicians. That is named after Elbridge Jerry, who was, he might've been the first governor of Massachusetts, and he drew a district that looked like a salamander in order to get his party you know, the advantage. And so that became called a gerrymander. And uh, hence these you know, hundreds of years on, we're talking about gerrymandering. So, so that was the rule from the, from the beginning. And then the other one that really people need to understand is party primaries was part of what came out of the reforms from the Gilded Age. So we got this direct election of senators, but then in Wisconsin, my home state, we actually also had this idea that, wow, candidates are being picked in backroom deals in the proverbial smoke-filled rooms. And those are the candidates that, you know, sort of usually glide to victory. So even though people are voting, they're not really having much say because the deal's been made. So how about we have these party primaries where it's not a few party people in a smoke-filled room picking the candidate, but people will pick the candidates of the parties and that would you know, make things better. So the idea was there that it's about giving voters power. It turns out as you know, and we'll discuss here, I'm sure that party primaries have had dramatic unintended consequences and they're actually at the core of our problems today of voters actually not having power. And sometimes that happens when you change the rules, they have unintended consequences or what usually happens is over time, the parties will optimize around them if we're not paying attention in ways that create the negative consequences. You dive in and one of the things I really love about the book is that you dive into, if you will, the data behind the disaffection, the disappointment in politics. So in other words, rather than just saying, yeah, there's only a 10% approval rating of the job that Congress is doing. And that is going to tie into what they did in California and some of the data that comes out of how they changed their primary system. But we'll get to that in a bunch. But um, not only is it only 10% approval rating, but then you go and you show real data on America in decline. And the fact that because we have national political infrastructure that is doing nothing, that this gridlock is actually hurting us every single day. And you put in a ton of stats on American competitiveness on, you know, what are we 32nd in access to drinking water and a bunch of other things that are just, you know, for a com country with as much money and resources that we have, the richest country on the face of the planet, to have our competitiveness be going down at such a dramatic rate. At some point, the body politic has to say, stop, we really need Washington to do something. But you also show a graph, Catherine, that's I find to be incredible, which is in 2004, 
you really had Democrats and Republicans title affiliation of 34% of voting public there, of Democrat, 34% Republican, and 31% independent. And then over the last 15 years, you go to 2019, those numbers have gone to 28% Republican, 30% Democrat, and 41% independent. And so the, the, the voting base is actually kind of being disaffected by the two-party system. And yet exactly back to your analysis, so the customer isn't being you know, met, the customer isn't getting their needs met by Washington. And yet at the same time, the old system is still in place. Um, and it's just fascinating the data that you have of both American competitiveness going down where the consumer is saying, I want more. And at the same time, they're also starting to identify as independents at numbers that we've never seen before. Yeah. And we don't really know most of these things are happening. And I'm not even sure the media really knows that this is happening. Let's give another example that isn't in the book, but um just in a pop quiz kind of way, because you clearly know all the data in my book, how much, so Alaska, it's a red state, right? So how much, uh, what's the percentage of Alaskans that are Republican? Uh, I'll swag it. You said it's a red state. I'll say 78%. 24%. (laughs) And the Democrats are 13%. So it is more red than blue everybody else is an independent. And yet we can only see that states are red or blue, even when they're not any of that. And by the way, the parties, the the Republicans then sort of think they own Alaska, right? Because it's red. And Democrats think they own states where there's a plurality of Democrats. But why should they? The voters in that state, which consist of Democrats, Republicans, and independents, should be the ones, you know, figuring out who wins, which is why we need to make sure that November elections, you know, matter. So things are not how we think. Could I give one example, uh, uh, just a good story that also might relate to the functioning today, just to, to bring some life to this idea that what we think is wrong with politics and what's going on is not usually what's really going on? Um, so, you know, we're going to have this debt ceiling fight now, right? right? And there's another fight that we often have, which is over appropriations, whether we're going to actually, you know, pass the budget to fund the government. And then if we don't, we have a, we have a government shutdown. So these are similar kinds of fights, which is if uh, one party's in charge, then they don't want to have the shutdown, but the other party does and it kind of can go back and forth that way. So go back to 2013. This was uh, one of the major the government shutdowns. It was the 16 day one. And it you know, shut the country down for these 16 days and it was terrible. But here's the thing that nobody reported on then or really since. That government shutdown didn't ever have to happen and it could have it could have ended from you know day one if then Speaker John Boehner, the Republican, had allowed a floor vote on legislation that had already been passed by the Senate and that was supported by a majority of the members of the House, which is to say virtually all the Democrats and plus a good number of Republicans, but a minority of Republicans. And in fact, that shutdown ended only when Speaker Boehner broke with his party and broke the the Hastert rule, which I'll tell you about, to allow the vote. So the Hastert rule is something back then nobody had heard of. It's getting a little bit more play right now. But the Hastert rule was a rule started um, by Speaker Denny Hastert from Illinois, and it's named after him. It's not written down anywhere. But what it says is the Speaker of the House, so previously Nancy Pelosi, now Kevin McCarthy, will not allow the House of Representatives that's supposed to represent all of us, will not allow the House to vote on any bill unless a majority of the majority supports that bill, which is to say a majority of the Speaker's party. So since, and regardless of what the public wants or what the House wants, they just don't even vote on it. So we, so 
even election that's supported by a majority of the country or majority of the House has virtually no chance of passing because they'll never even be a vote. They'll never even be a vote in our democracy. And that's what happened in 2013 is there wasn't a vote until 16 days in, John Boehner said, even though a majority of the majority, the Republicans don't support it, I'm going to allow this vote because this has got to end. And then it ended. And effectively, this made up rule that nobody talks about cements majority party control in a legislature that's supposed to represent all U.S. citizens. And in this case, it allowed a small number of extreme partisans to hold this country hostage in a shutdown for 16 days that cost us billions of dollars and 90% of the country never wanted it from, from the beginning. That's how we're running. So we shouldn't be talking about, oh, we disagree about these things. We should be talking about why we're not going to have a vote on things that could pass if we allowed things to pass in a bipartisan way. And nobody yeah. wants things to pass in a bipartisan way. The, the two numbers out of that example that struck me was, A, the calculation is $24 billion is what it cost the United States of America to shut down the government for that period of time. $24 billion, over a billion dollars a day. And the other is that 90% of the American population didn't want the government to be shut down. So there are 10% of hyper-partisans who say shut it down and don't pay a bill and whatever else. But it's it's just and not- And we acted <laughs> as if it's normal yeah. that one person- could you know stop us from voting on it? So one of the things that's interesting about that is that you talked through, and I don't know to what degree we ought to go into too much painstaking detail because there aren't that many political nerds out there like me who really, really enjoy getting into the minutia of this stuff. But generally speaking, Catherine, talk for a moment about that this consolidation of power into the controlling party in Congress really started during the era of Tip O'Neill. And so the Democrats started the process where they started to Basically, um, rather than having a tenure and seniority structure for um, chairman of various committees, um, that then was taken from the Ways and Means Committee and went to the, um, what is it, the House uh, Strategic Planning and, and, and uh, some other committee that the chair of the, 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 the um, Speaker of the House controls. Therefore, the chair, men or women of various committees were then appointed by the Speaker of the House, consolidating power in the party that is in power. And that during that period of time, there was a big kind of reorganization of Congress that said that if you hold that speakership, you have control of the House. And then it kind of went on steroids when Newt Gingrich got in in the mid 90s, where he came in and filled up committees with people who, who were freshmen congressmen and women who'd come in on his Take Back America strategy. Um, he uh, put in some chairmen and women of various committees that were very hyper-partisan. And a lot of people kind of put the partisan nature of Congress today at the feet of Newt Gingrich. But from reading your book, it's very clear that it was bipartisan in kind of the grab for power that now makes it so that when you've got the speakership, you control everything. Um, how do we get out of that? Let's make one thing, let's reinforce one thing you just said. All the problems in our existing democracy that emanate from structural rules were created over time by bipartisan action. It's been in most cases a step down, like one party ekes out a certain advantage, kind of pushes the envelope here, and then the other says, well, you did that, now I'll do this, and it just keeps going like that. And we're usually the public not paying attention, which is why you can end up with this Hastert rule. And this here's the step down on the Hastert rule. So remember, I just said the Hastert rule is the speaker won't allow a vote unless a majority of the majority supports it. Now it's turned more to the speaker will not allow a vote unless they can pass it only with their party. Right. Only with their party. And so... Um, so that's the step down that's happening, and that's what we should be writing about when this debt ceiling thing comes up. Um, it's not just focusing on the fight, but focusing on the recurring problem and that it's jointly both parties at fault. And, and one just quick thing. You show some great graphs in your book about you go back to the highway bill 
1956, yes. I think it was. And the highway bill was fully bipartisan. You look, you show in the graphs, the voting of Democrats and Republicans, and then you get to all major legislation that we've seen in the last decade, and it is hyper-partisan. In other words, there's no vote for anything unless it is passed by the ruling party. And it's just, I mean, you see this graph and to look at it graphically where you've got sort of, if you will, black and white on these bar charts that are perfectly in the middle of 50-50 bipartisan on really important things. And then you get down to the American Affordable Care Act. You get down to the to the uh, Trump tax cuts. And you just see that Affordable Care Act, Affordable Care Act was all Democrat. And the Tax Cuts uh, and Jobs Act of 2016 was all Republican. Mm -hmm. But there's one exception that we should point out. There is absolutely a time when we can guarantee bipartisan action. And these are the conditions. You have to have a crisis and it's either a national security crisis or a natural disaster crisis. And both parties have to, uh, they'll agree and they'll put it on the credit card. So here's what I mean is they'll pass the funding for COVID because it's a natural, you know, it's this disaster for the country. And they will make sure it just goes on the national debt and they don't cut anything to pay for it. And they agree not to tell on each other. And then they both get to say, we did this great bipartisan thing in this moment of crisis. And we do that when we go to war, right? We don't pay for that. We do that um, when we give relief uh, to you know, hurricane states, which I'm not saying you shouldn't do those things. What I'm saying is, they do they the bipartisan action along with getting it for free for us but not for our children is when you're going to get bipartisan action and that is and, and they'll trumpet that and I want to say well, I could make a lot of deals if things were free okay I mean couldn't you yeah. and I could deliver a lot of things if things were free and so they're tricking us that way and there is no party of fiscal responsibility anymore because neither of them are incented to talk about that. And yet they're going to talk about it when they don't want the other side to, you know, sort of do something um, that is traditionally the other side's ideology. Then they'll care about the debt. Talk for a moment, as, as you talk about Boehner and Boehner basically, you know, to, to continue forward and put the Hastert rule to the side and, and keep the government going. As we know, Boehner didn't last long as Speaker of the House after he did that. Um, you raised the example of Mike Castle from Delaware, which I thought was a unbelievable example of how messed up our primary system is. And this will lead into some of the reforms that you and Mike put 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 forth. But talk for a moment, Catherine, about about Mike Castle when Joe Biden became vice president of the United States after being U.S. senator from Delaware for 32 years before he became vice president. That is a great story. And once again, it's not the story that got written. So, so here it is. So there he is now, um, you know, Joe Biden no longer able to serve as the senator because he's the vice president. So they now have a, an election for the new uh, Senate seat. And I am told that everybody in Delaware knew who was going to be the next senator from the state of Delaware. And it was uh, a man named Mike Castle. He was a multiple term governor, termed out as governor, and a multiple term congressman. And he was the most popular politician in the state, a Republican. So he ran uh, in his party's primary and he lost. And that was um, super shocking, but it's a low turnout primary. That was when the Tea Party was starting. And so he lost to a woman named Christine O'Donnell, um, and there were only like 30,000 votes in that primary in the state of 6 million people, and he lost because it was low turnout, even though he's the most popular politician. So what's pretty rational is that he could have put himself on the ballot in November as an independent, and he, just, he didn't get the Republican nomination, and he would have won beating both the Democratic nominee and Christine O'Donnell, who had, was public nominee. But of course, we've never heard of Senator Mike Castle, have we? No, because there was this problem, which is that Delaware has pretty odd law, and it's called the sore loser law. And what that means 
is that if you run and lose in your party's primary, Republican or Democrat, you are not allowed to have your name on the November ballot when everybody's going to turn out. No matter what November voters might want, you cannot have your name on that ballot for them to choose from, which is how the parties control access to the ballot. So Mike Castle couldn't put his name on there. And uh, therefore, we have, uh, I think it's Senator Chris Coons, Chris uh, Coons. Democrat, because he beat the, the Republican. And um, the question is, how many states have what seems to be a massively undemocratic kind of law, right? How many states have that law? And the answer 44. is, well, you know, uh, it's, yes. Um, and it used, to, it's actually, and it used to be 46, but it's been changed in two states. If you recall, there was a kind of a similar system situation where Senator Joe Lieberman yeah. lost his party primary for Senate and then he put himself on the ballot in Connecticut as an independent and um, and he won, proving that that's what the voters in Connecticut wanted. And that's because Connecticut was then one of only four states that didn't have a sore loser law. It's unbelievable. It's, right? So that's what, part really of the reason why independents never you know, have any choices. There's there's lots of them, but the parties have colluded to make sure that happens all around the country. The, the sore loser law just... The, the Lieberman example, as well as the Castle example, are just, they make your jaw drop. They really do. Um, and you make, the, you make the point in the book that only 20%, I mean, the, the voter turnout of re, only 20% of registered voters show up for these primaries. And so as a result of that, you get very small turnout. It's hyper-partisan. And every single candidate who wants to play any kind of a centrist role, I mean, the whole reason that Castle was sort of turned on by his his party was because he'd come out for the bailout of Wall Street in the great financial crisis. I mean, he'd been he'd done all sorts of great things throughout his nine terms in Congress to show that he was an amazing Republican. And he'd done things with George H.W. Bush on on education reform and all sorts of things. And as you said, he was the most popular politician, more popular than Joe Biden in the state of Delaware. And yet he gets primaried and then they lose and they don't get their person to Washington. It makes zero sense. Yes, and you might also remember um, Eric Cantor, who was oh, the um, right. yeah. you know, the number two Republican in the House, and he got primaried out by a Tea Party candidate, in part because although Democrats didn't consider him to be really, you know, bipartisan, he was accused of having worked too much with the other party to solve difficult problems. So if we penalize that problem solving behavior. And if we penalize getting sustainable deals on, you know, big issues, which would require a consensus way forward. So we don't just careen back and forth, repealing and replacing things. If you can't get reelected by doing those things, then you're not going to do those things. And that's why we don't solve our problems in the bipartisan, sustainable consensus way, which we know the outlines of behind closed doors. So if I could update though my data for you. Okay. So on, cause it's worse than I said in the book. Uh, it nothing, can't got be worse. nothing got There's better. No you, you, I, I, got, I got really optimistic that, that, that back when you, you know, when, when, when Lieberman did it, there were only four states who didn't have the poison, the, 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 the sore loser rule. And then it's now down to 44. So there are actually six states that allow yeah. you to, to run in there. I thought we were heading in the right direction. You're now going to turn it around and say, no, it's like 49 states. Well, I'm not going to talk about the sore loser law. That's still, okay. um, th there's uh, fewer because now Alaska has the system I'm going to be proposing here today, right. for example. Yeah. But, um, but let me talk about something more critical. Okay. So Election day is in November, right? But here's a date no one talked about this year that was a huge, huge consequential day. And that was September 13th of 2022. Because on that day, there should have been big headlines in the newspaper saying, announcement, 85% of the US House chosen, decided, game over, election done. And 65% of the US Senate chosen, game over, all done. Because 
September 13th was the day of the last party primaries in our country. And in any seat that is safe red or safe blue, we always know that whoever wins that party primary is guaranteed to win in November. That's what a safe seat is. And so we're sort of numb to this. We don't really notice it, but let's bring it forward. As of that date, you know, the majority of the House and Senate were chosen, again, over 85% of the House, and only 8% of the American public had voted in those party primaries that chose those 85% of the of the um, House winners. Only 8%. So now, doesn't that seem crazy and undemocratic? Yes. But here's the problem that, that's even worse that we need to care about, is that when people on, when Republicans are elected, by 8% of voters who turn out in these low turnout summer primaries months before all voters show up, and Democrats are elected by 8% over here, these are the only customers, to go back to thinking about this as an industry, these are the only voters, the only customers that these representatives can really afford to consider when they're deciding how to act and how to vote when they're in Congress when they're serving, because these are the bosses. These are the people that give them their jobs, and these are the people that are going to take their jobs away. And while you might think that this 8% and this 8% could not be more different from another, right, because they're right and left, they're actually virtually identical in one wildly consequential way. And that is that these 8% are characterized by what political scientists call negative partisanship. And negative partisanship means that you are motivated far less by how much you like the ideals and policies that your party is promoting, and much more you're motivated by how much you hate the other side. So when people hate the other side more than they care about any you know, accomplishments ideologically, they actually like to see these fights. They like to see the other party lose. They like, they prefer, in a sense, gridlock to solving a problem where you'd have to give something up. So look, I'm a party primary voter. I'm sure you vote in primaries. I'm not denigrating party primary voters. I'm just saying that when that the fact is that when only 8% of the country controls the behavior of the majority of our House and Senate, th what we've got is what we're going to get. So let's go to your solutions because they're, 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 they're interesting and they, they, they open one's mind. Um, and the, the first is final five. Uh, and so, you know, right now in the duopoly structure, moderates need not apply. Um, there's no space. If you can't pick up the, you know, the part of your 8% that's going to vote in the party primary and get to exactly the points that they want. No point in showing up. And you give great examples of, you know, really talented people who show up and, and, and they get the, oh, you're too centrist, or we're going to lose if you come in because you're going to take votes away from the Republican or the Democratic candidate. And so all these great moderate candidates, you know, you, you, you talk a bunch about Ross Perot and the fact that Ross Perot getting 19% of the vote did all of us a great favor to at least say, and Ross Perot was distinct, he had a ton of money. I saw his son yesterday in Washington and we talked a lot about his dad. Um, and, you know, Ross Perot uh, was that light of an independent candidate, but even Mike Bloomberg, with all of his wealth and all of his track record as mayor of New York, did not in any way, I mean, he obviously tried as a Democrat, but he, he had no avenue as an independent with his billions, and I mean, he had a lot more money than Ross Perot does. Um, but Ross Perot was at the time the perfect person. And there are plenty of people who also blame Ross Perot for giving the presidency to Bill Clinton because they thought that George H.W. Bush would have won that re-election had Ross Perot not gotten into it. And so he was a pariah with Republicans, even though Ross Perot is saying, I like ideas on both sides. With all that said, your idea on final five, 
talk for a moment about why Final Five would change the primary system and then we'll get to what you want to do in the general. Yeah, so if I could once more just back up for a moment before I talk about Final Five and talk about what we're solving for. So I've, I do have a solution, but I want to make it clear what it's a solution to. So as much as I do believe that a consensus way forward oftentimes, well, we'll almost always need some moderates and centrists to be for it. And oftentimes, you know, it runs that way. I'm not solving for that we, that moderates are like the only good kind of politician. I actually, innovation never rarely comes from a consensus middle. It comes from what are, you know, fringes at the time. We wouldn't have the civil rights movement if the only kind of uh, leaders we elected were people who were at the, you know, exact middle of where current public opinion is. Leadership isn't necessarily there. So we we do need moderates and we've rendered them extinct in our existing uh, culture, but that's not what we're solving for here. We're not solving for who needs to win. We're solving for what any winners, regardless of what party or ideals they come with, what winners need to do, what actions do they need to be incented to be taking in order to actually solve problems in the interest of you know, the broad public interest and a way forward for the country as a whole. So what, what people would need to do if you're trying to solve complex problems with trade-offs, and that's the only kind we have, because even our crummy system would solve our problems if they were easy. So think of the trade-offs involved in immigration or um, our national debt or national security or entitlement uh, questions um, or climate change or anything people are concerned about. There's trade-offs. So what you need to do to solve those kinds of things is have our legislators talk to each other. They'd have to come up with possibly some innovative ways forward, and then they'd have to negotiate maybe this, maybe I could trade you that, you know, maybe we could reach agreement on these things and they'd have to make a deal. And then they'd have to be able to vote yes on that deal. They'd have to, which means that they would have to believe that they had a way to re-election if they voted yes on the negotiated deal. And we don't see those kind of actions in Congress today because those actions pretty much guarantee you lose your primary. So we're not trying to elect, in, here's the best way of putting it. If we could choose right now, you and me, Scott, that we could find the smartest person in the world to give us all the perfect people to be in our House and Senate, or, and that would be choice A, all perfect people, or B, but, but keep the rules of the game the same, the rules of how they get reelected the same, or B, we could keep all the same people and change the rules of how they're gonna get reelected, to make sure they can only get reelected in November, not in low turnout party primaries. Which would we do for the good of the country? I'd pick B in a heartbeat. Right. So, so what final five voting does is it changes the rules of how people get and keep their jobs to create a connection between taking those kinds of actions and voting yes on these kind of, of solutions dealing with trade-offs on complex problems and the likelihood that they'll get reelected. So we're not trying to take self-interest away or say you should just do the right thing. We're trying to say doing the right thing will actually increase your chances of re-election instead of guarantee that you lose your job. It's the most obvious thing that needs to be done in the world. You never have your business people uh, do the things you need them to do and that's how they get fired. It would be the opposite. So final five voting is the name, it's the one name for two changes to our election system. The first change, which you were referring to, is something we change in the party primary. We just get rid of them. Let's not have them, right? Let the party primary, let the parties choose their own nominees, however they want their private organizations. Instead, we'll have a single preliminary round and everybody runs on the same ballot and everybody votes regardless of party use uh, from the same set of candidates. You pick one, your favorite, polls close, we count the votes and the top five finishers advance to the general election. So it's not one Democrat and one Republican and a lesser of two evils election anymore. We've got five competitors and they could be, if it's a red district, you could have 
three of them be Republicans or four and uh, or the other way around. And you could have some independents in there, Green Party, Libertarian, et cetera. So it goes to the general election. Then now that we're going to benefit from this dynamic, diverse competition between uh, of these five candidates between the preliminary round and the general, we need to figure out who should win in the general. And we can't just let one of these five win with like 21% of the vote if the vote split relatively equally five ways, because that wouldn't help us. We need to figure out who has the broadest support from all these November voters. And to do that, we just use instant runoffs to narrow these five candidates down to the final two, at which point, you know, obviously the person with the majority wins. But instant runoffs are just like a series of physical runoffs. But instead of having to keep coming back for another vote, you know, when you go from five candidates to four candidates to three candidates to two candidates, instead of having to keep coming back, you just cast all your votes at once by indicating your preferences on a ranked ballot. Like this is my favorite, this is my second favorite, all the way down to over my dead body. Do I want Catherine Gale to you know be my senator and she's my fifth choice? Um, and so we will always, out of final five voting, have true competition in November. Nobody will have been able to win before November voters showed up. Nobody can win in the summer anymore. There's no, there's nothing safe that way. It might be a Republican seat. And it might be for sure that a, a Republican is going to win, but which Republican is going to win will be chosen in November when everybody's there. And so uh, so we do that and they're chosen by a majority of voters, which and, means and they answer to a majority of voters, which means that they actually can take the actions that we just talked about. People elected in November can afford to and actually are incented to negotiate, to make deals, to find a consensus solution. And they'll still, in most cases, be Republicans and Democrats, although now there's space for all the new competition we need to put that pressure on Republicans and Democrats to get the job done. Um, and that's how we would change things. And it would so change A, a couple of things there that I, that I found to be fascinating in, in, in reading the book. The first is that on the, on the ranking, one of the things that um, is important is today we can have somebody who wins 36% of the vote go to Washington. The way that ranked choice voting goes is you will have someone have to win over 50% of the vote. And if they don't get it on the first round, then the votes of number five go up to number one and they get reallocated on the ranking that you just put forth until someone gets over it. And so I thought that that was really interesting that you will get someone at the end of the day who does have a majority of support of the voters. Um, the other thing that I thought was fascinating was that you point out that California and Oregon actually have top two elections since 2012, and that instantaneously the number of elections in California deemed competitive doubled. Literally in two years, they doubled as being competitive because of doing this top two. You all have proposed top five to make it a broader field. And you use the analogy in the book, Catherine, as it relates to the, the final four, which I thought was fantastic. Because you're like, if Duke and Kentucky were sent to the national championship every year, Duke and Kentucky fans would be really happy. But what about everyone else who has their team that gets in there and you get a diverse group of schools that everyone has that underdog who can kind of make it in there. And if we just went back to Duke and Kentucky every year, it gets pretty boring. And, and we know what the, you know, I mean, great for Duke and Kentucky fans, but not great for the, for the general viewing public. Um, the one other thing that I thought was fascinating when you focused on California and the top two is that Nancy Pelosi and Kevin McCarthy, both from the state of California, hate top two voting because they like their party system. They want to ensure that because they're at the top of their parties, that no one can come along and kick them off of their their spot, which I just it was such a perfect example of here. We have the two, the speaker today and the previous speaker both in the state of California, both in a state that has open too, and they both hate this because it's actually getting voters what they want. Yeah, I mean, let's say uh, I want final five voting because I think we'll be able to get a lot of things done. And in that sense, you can think of it as being a uniting you know, election system, um, but it's already proven it's uniting potential because it has united both um, of the establishment, you know, the party structures, the political industrial complex against it. 
Yeah, they both oppose it. So it was just kind of a good sign. Let me say something really important though about what was it Duke and Kentucky? Is that is that who we were saying would be the final two? Yeah, right. I just so here's that, so yeah, not yeah. only would it be quote bad for the viewing public, here's the point. If they were always going to be there over time, they might not be very good. They just have to be better than the one other. And there might be tons of teams down here that are way better, but they don't ever get the chance to show it. So these guys have no threat of competition that keeps them being any good. Uh, right? 100% so, Duke and Kentucky so, both aren't having very good basketball seasons. So if we had them already guaranteed to be in the national championship, everyone would be greatly disappointed. Yeah. And they wouldn't have to try very hard and they could put their money into their other teams, you know, but still win all these championships in a sense. So what, what competition does, it's not, I want the competition of final five voting not to say that if we had three parties, everything would work or four parties or something. It's the threat of new entrants. It's the uh, what competition delivers in any human endeavor, which is innovation results and accountability. So let's go back to the Perot example and, and, and look at it this way. So Perot, only got 19% of the electoral vote, yes. And no, uh, sorry, 19% of the popular vote and zero electoral votes. So you could say, you know, he just lost. But guess who won when Perot ran? The American public, because Perot ran on debt and deficit reduction and also anti-NAFTA, but debt deficit reduction. Neither the Democrats or the Republicans had had reducing the national debt on their platforms Previously, it was not their priority, but then Perot had his charts and he was telling everybody how important it was. And that was my uh, that was my first time I got to vote and I voted for Perot because I cared about the debt deficit then. And I was already politically homeless, I suppose. Anyway, so what happened after that? The Democrats and the Republicans worked together to deliver balanced budgets in the, in the second of Clinton's two terms because they felt political pressure from this 19% of the electorate and they didn't wanna cede that issue to a nascent third party, which was Perot's reform party because that competition could hurt both of them. So they decided to solve it. So competition helps even when it doesn't change who wins because it changes what winners do. Yeah. And again, that's what we're about is what winners are going to do. And um, so the, the only way we're ever going to have fiscal sanity in this country is if it becomes an issue that makes a difference in who wins and loses in November. And that will only be if someone can offer a different you know, uh, a platform. So we need the competition, not just not to change necessarily who wins, as I say, but to change what the winners are going to do and what they're going to care about and to bring forth new issues and innovative ideas into the system. That's what competition is going to give us. And I would, I would only underscore your comment about Perot and what his movement did to, you, you think about the economy between 96 and 2000. The Democrats will take and take responsibility that Clinton was in the White House. The Republicans will take responsibility that Gingrich was in the House. The issue is that the economy grew dramatically during those four years, and it was due to having that undercurrent. And also, to your exact point, it's not that you're looking for centrists and everyone needs to come by ya and hold hands. You had, to some degree, a hyperpartisan in the House of Representatives and a hyperpartisan in the White House. And yet that underlying competitive force of Perot got them to work together and drive the economy forth and made it so that, you know, I mean, we had that and that was when tech was coming forth. That's when the economy was growing incredibly. I mean, it's really quite something that you identified that force from Perot being in that early election of what it forced Clinton and the Gingrich Congress to do. And returning to a theme that I've had, which is often what's going on is not what gets reported as going on. So it hasn't been reported that way, that, that it was Perot's competitive threat. In fact, when I was coming out with my book, we published um, to coincide with the book's release, an article in the Harvard Business Review about this whole theory. And I gave, I gave this example in there about Perot and the Harvard Business Review editors wrote back to me, you know, in the comments and said, no, no, the 
the deficit, you know, went away. We got these balanced budgets because of the advice of Clinton's economic advisors and the expanding economy, which actually both of those things did contribute. But they didn't believe me, even though it totally derives from the theory that Perot was a huge force in it and that you needed that force to, um, to incent them to even follow and take advantage of the expanding economy to reduce debt instead of just to buy more stuff. And the only way I got it in there is I was able to send them, Ross Perot had, uh, God bless him, died in the previous year or, or two years. And Paul Begala, who was one of Clinton's advisors in the White House, had written a piece when, when Perot died where he said, and I quote, it is doubtful that we would have solved that issue without the pressure that Perot's voters brought to the table. So it's I was, and I, I mean, that just theoretically shows, and I had actually written on the same day when Perot died, I actually had written about what we got from Perot. But of course, you know, my theory wasn't quite enough. But when Paul Begala says it, we understand that it is indeed true. That's competition. It's fantastic. We love competition, you know, here in America in business. I mean, it's created such good. And yet somehow... We have a protected duopoly in politics, and we think that we naturally have a two-party system. Absolutely not. We can get ourselves a multi-competitor system. And I personally, though, don't care if it's two parties, as long as they feel they've got to get things done that please, you know, lots of us, or they'll get replaced. That's what we need. We just need the threat of new competition. On that, I will say thank you so much for spending an hour with me. I love the book. Um, it's a great framing of such an important issue. Love all the work. Oh, go ahead. Yeah. Oh, super quickly. So final five voting isn't a theory. It exists. Alaska passed the earlier version, which is final four voting, in 2020 by referendum. They have changed their all their elections for their state legislature, their statewide offices, and their fe federal delegation. Nevada passed final five voting in 2022. If they pass it again in 24, it will be the law of the land for their elections. We have campaigns in 10 states at earlier stages. So this is a real thing that really is happening. It's not just a nice idea. It exists. And everybody here, if they're interested, can get involved in making this happen. Business leaders are often the core of the drivers to uh, change these rules in each state. With that, Catherine, thank you so much. Thank you everyone for joining us today. We'll be back next week with another Walker webcast. Thanks, Catherine. It was a real joy. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye.